In this video, we're visiting Trelefan, a fascinating site that features ancient rock art and has yielded important finds relating to the earliest dairy production in Wales. Situated on private land a couple of miles north of Nevin and just round the corner from Clecker Dribbid that we covered in our last video, this partially collapsed monument is in the midst of Pembrokeshire's rich Neolithic history, dating back at least 6,000 years. Unlike most of the ancient sites that we've visited recently, this one is on private land with no public right of way leading up to it or running closely by. And being a third of a kilometre off the road and slightly in a dip, the only way to view this monument is with permission from the landowner. So bear in mind that this is a busy farm with lots of cattle using the fields and depending on a lot of factors, permission may not be available when you visit. That being said, on the day we were out filming Klecker Dribbid, we drove past Trelefant and happened to see a quad bike on the other side of the hedge. We arrived at a gateway in unison, and whether out of politeness or sheer coincidence, he stopped. So we got out to inquire about the stones, and he immediately said that we were welcome to go and have a look. It may have helped that it was a beautiful day, but he was very welcoming and spoke enthusiastically about archaeologist George Nash, the Welsh Rock Art Organisation, and the excavations and research that had been carried out at the site. He continued on to advise us the best route to take, considering that he was about to move the cows, and directed us to park as close as possible, which was pretty much in his garden. Throw in the fact that we also had our dog with us, I think it's fair to give this a 10 out of 10 on the friendly farmer scale. The monument itself appears quite ruined compared to other examples we have locally, and at first glance could be mistaken for a haphazard pile of stones. But upon further inspection, there seem to have been two chambers, one of which is still partially intact. And thankfully, you can still see the rock art which covers the capstone, around 75 cut marks and possibly several lines. Recorded finds of cut marks on capstones are still relatively rare, which makes it all the more important that only two miles from here is the Trefile Stone, a large recumbent stone which is also covered in cut marks and thought to have once been a capstone on a cromlech as well. Trelefint was recently part of a four-year study initially focused on the rock art covering its capstone, but it also included an earthwork survey of the site, which has revealed a range of important discoveries. We've put a link in the description to a video of George Nash describing his initial research all the way up to the eventual finds, because in this video we're going to focus more on the folklore of the site. But to briefly cover the key points, the discoveries included fragments of pottery, flint and chert. The remains of pottery were a particularly special discovery, because the acidity level of the local soil meant that pottery and bone very rarely survive in this area. What made it even more exceptional was that the pottery actually contained traces of burnt-on food residues. This indicated that the vessels were used for cooking, and further testing revealed that the residue originated from milk-based substances, such as butter, cheese, or likely yoghurt. This was then dated to around 3100 BC, which represents the earliest known direct evidence of dairy production in Wales, and confirmed that Neolithic groups were exploiting dairy by at least the 4th millennium BC, and most likely earlier. Unlike many of our favourite ancient sites, this one has a strange tale associated with its name and the land on which it lies. Trelefant is said to mean home of the toads, or even simply Toad Hall, which stems from an old story documented by medieval priest and historian Geraldus Cambrenis. His Itinerarium Cambria, the itinerary through Wales, was written around 1188 and included the following paragraph. Two circumstances occurred in the province of Cumais, the one in our time, the other a little before, which I think right not to pass over in silence. In our time, a young man native of this country, during a severe illness, suffered as violent a persecution from toads as if the reptiles of the whole province had come to him by agreement and though destroyed by his nurses and friends, they increased again on all sides in infinite numbers, like Hydra's heads. His attendants, both friends and strangers, being wearied out, he was drawn up in a kind of bag, into a high tree stripped of its leaves and shred. But nor was he there secure from his venomous enemies, for they crept up the tree in great numbers and consumed him even to the very bones. The young man's name was Cecilus Escahir, that is, Cecilus Longleg. There are many versions of the tale, some go on much longer, describing in detail his fear of the large black toads, adding details about the construction of the leather sack and delving into the emotions of those present. But all versions agree on the same integral parts of this tale that has endured through the centuries, and although the name of the afflicted man has been retranslated, the core parts of the name have even remained the same, Esgair being Welsh for leg or shank, and Hir meaning long. Therefore, most modern versions simply call him the English Cecil Longshanks. 
600 years after Giraudus, Richard Fenton writes about him in his book, one which has quickly become a channel favourite, a historical tour through Pembrokeshire. In it, he says, I proceed to Trelefan, or Toadstown, the place alluded to by Giraudus Cabrensis, who relates a singular story of a person here being destroyed by toads, and a light to see the figure of a toad, well sculpted in black marble, which is introduced into a chimney piece, and was formerly covered with glass to preserve it from any inquiry. It is said to have been brought from Italy, the work of a foreign artist. My inquiries as to the date of its introduction here were fruitless, and all I could learn was that it had filled the present station for some centuries, but perhaps on too vague an authority to be dependent upon. Whether the present occupiers of Trelefan are descendants of the original family, one of whom was the unfortunate victim of Duraldus's account, I cannot pretend to say, but they have lived there for some generations, and as the respectable clergyman our companion informed me, who traces to the same stock, bear a toad for their crest, adopted at first, no doubt, from a motive of piety, as it were, to commemorate that supposed horrid visitation, and by reminding the bearer of it to correct human pride. If stature or bodily peculiarities run in families and are hereditary, by fair inference might not the relationship in some degree be established between the former and the present possessors of Trelefan? Geraldus calls the devoted wretch of his time, Sicilt Eskir here, Sicilt Tibia Long, Sicilt Longshanks. Perhaps there can be few instances adduced of Taurus being continued in a family for so long as in this, every one of the present, as well as the former generation, being upward of six feet, and even a female, only 19 years of age, nearly as tall. Although our search for any images of the black marble toad proved fruitless, Fenton's apparent fixation with the tallness of the family in question, and repetition of the multiple spellings of the family name, led me to find an interesting document hosted on Kovlin.gov that suggests a different interpretation of the meaning of the name and links the story to other legends in the area. Titled The Archaeological Landscape of the Parish of Dinas, a summary and overview of the evidence. Written by Rhiannon Camo in 2008, it's an interesting read in its entirety and references lots of great sources for further research. So once again, please find a link in the description. The old name for Dinas Island was Innis Atlefant, or Innis Vachtlefan Gaur. Gaur means giant, Tlefan Tlefant means toad or frog, and recurs five miles away in the farm name Trelefant or Trelefan. Trelefan is linked with the story told by Geraldus Cabrensis about a man, Cecil Escahir, Cecil Longshanks, being consumed by frogs. But in his 1992 book, B.G. Charles considers that the name refers to the local marshy ground. It is conceivable, though, that Tlefan or Tlefant is a corruption of a personal name, and that Eskahir, Longshanks, and Gower, Giant, refer to the same tall person or family based in the Nevin area before the end of the 12th century. This would fit with the later links between Dinis Island and landowners from the Pentry of a Nevin area, and in his 1993 book, Bartram lists Tlefran Gower as a legendary giant linked to Castellifan on the Tyve in Ceredigion, whose wife was slain by Gwalthmai, the Gawain of Arthurian legend. Rhiannon goes on to say that the only other recorded folklore from Dinas concerns the Tre Bendith Amam, or Fairies Town. Bendith Amam, or the Blessing of the Mothers, being the 19th century Dinas term for the fairies. This was a floating island, sometimes seen in the sea near Pulse Gwylod. The islands of the Pembrokeshire fairies, also known as the Tuluk Teg, the fairy folk, or Plant Rees Thuban, children of Rees the Deep, apparently lay to the west. For this last part, she references J.C. Davis and the 1911 book Folklore of West and Mid Wales, which is free on Google Books, so you know what I'll be doing for the next few evenings. <laughs>